Hello everyone, welcome back to Portal, the 1986 computer novel. We're playing the Amiga version. If you're joining us for the first time, I do recommend catching up on our previous streams and videos to try and work out what's going on. I'll, um, I'm going to plunge straight back in so we can try and resume the story. Uh, suffice it to say, this is um, more a text adventure than anything else, but a text adventure um, with some record searching. Okay, I'm going to do the usual thing this time and we'll run through the categories. I believe we were told that SciTech would be the one to look at for our next unlock. So let's see if that's the case. The game usually throws in a few extra little bits and bobs as well in other places. So that's why I find it useful to check all the categories. We do of course have our um, characters statistics to look at, um, so we'll keep doing that. Okay, so we need to read about restructuring technology and that probably will unlock the next part of the story regarding um, Peter and friends, I imagine. Okay, restructuring technology. I wonder if we get an image for this. Let's have a look. Uh, no, just a corrupted home again. Okay, uh, Ref Antarctica Extrapolation CP Stroke SciTech AI. Here follows an extrapolated account of the restructuring process Peter DeVore and the others must have endured. They were alone, each of them, suspended in a field custom designed for each one. Dozens of different parameters, dozens of separate settings, all carefully calculated from the data collected over two months of Antarctic darkness, two lunar cycles of rhythms, daily, weekly, monthly, even by the minute and second. They've been analysed down to the molecule, their individual chromosomes were mapped to the final base pair, their brain chemical neurotransmitter enzyme and electrolyte flux had been encoded and stored. Now they would be modified. All those separate settings would create a new adjustment in their own DNA. New modified genes were formed from unnecessary old ones. The field isolated and manipulated their most intimate chemical natures. It wouldn't seem painful at first. The isolation, the strange sense of suffocation, parentheses, a side effect of the DNA manipulation, completely spurious disturbances of the nervous system, according to Thatcher, and nothing to worry about, end parentheses, the annoying hum of the field generators nearby, all these contrived to make the experience unpleasant, but too new to be painful. Gradually, though, the novelty of the experience wore off. When it did, the pain began. As the new layer grows, the old body distorts, and under the field, the new layer grows fast. The cells proliferate at a mad pace, dividing and dividing, consuming all nutrients available and hungering for more. Tubes and implants try to meet the new organ's need for chemicals, but are always behind, always late, and so the hunger grows. The itch has become fire, and underneath the fire is a hunger so voracious and ravening that it cannot be denied. The pain goes on and on. Nothing can stop it. No holding of the breath, no screaming or moaning, no begging for mercy. Those small alien cells grow and compact, grow and compact. They push the skin away from the muscle. This is not normal human fat. This is tailored and new. The pain fills the body with its echo, and the echoes go on and on as well. The face catches fire, the eyes start from the head, pressure mounts and does not let go. For months the agony continues. Months. Just as it finally begins to subside, the eyes begin to change. The transparent polarising membrane grows just under and behind the lids. It is as if, so survivors have said, someone were pushing hot wires through the eyelids, then through the eyes themselves. Ugh. Well that was... Um, Chillingly effective. Bit of prose. For months. Wow. Okay. Um, Alright, that's... Ooh. That's probably the most effective um, thing I've read in this, uh, this whole um, narrative so far. That was quite disturbing. Alright, let's uh, see if we can shake that off and look at something in history. Anything there? Nothing new. Okay. Military. How about that?
No. Okay, then we're up to life support, so let's find our next character to run through the stats of. So we've done this page, we've done the first two um, entries on this one, and we are up to Frederick Martin. So let's have a look at Frederick Martin. Uh, male, um, born the 7th of June 2056 in Montreal. And then let's have a look at their blood pressure. There we go, that's the old blood pressure. This is temperature. This is uh, respiratory and GSR. So if you if this is your first um, video watching along here, uh, this is basically outside of the main narrative anyway. This is the characterization we get for um, basically any named person within this story. We get these series of charts. This is tension, by the way. Um, DNA and hormones is coming up. There we go. So we get these graphical descriptions of um, person's uh, biochemistry and also their um, like psychological and skills assessments, I would say. Um, so this is neurotrans... No, this was the DNA and hormones, right? Or did I do, did I do neurotransmitters and distract myself? I did. That was neurotransmitters. And this is glycogen M, which I've temporarily forgotten what the M stands for. But there you go. So there's levels of that. Uh, so yeah, so we go through these um, for the characters. Uh, not I, well, I'm doing it in the hope that if we need to do it to unlock something, that's what we're achieving. Otherwise, I've, I find we don't get a lot of narrative information out of those charts. So at the moment, we're sort of uh, working our way through peripheral characters information uh, because we got the, the main characters information uh, a lot earlier on in the, um, in the process. I'm wondering if it will actually unlock anything. I'm curious. All right, so Frederick Martin. So in this database we've got um, the family tree to look at, which is a little bit different. So we've got the Allen branch of the family and the Martin branch of the family there. So far, I mean, we haven't needed this for any kind of detective work. There isn't really any detective work. There's just have a look through everything until you find something you haven't read yet. Um, but I feel like um, with some tweaks, that's something this uh, experience could have had. It could have, it could have been more of a um, research detective game, which certainly I would, I would have enjoyed. Um, so we've just had a look at uh, physiology and ESP and basic core IQ there. Once again, distracting myself by talking. Um, we've got two more of these stats categories to look through. We've got psychology here. We'll have Ed Mord in a, in a moment. So let's get down to... Oh, no, went too far there. Um, has this list got longer? Possibly. Okay, so in psychology we've got emotion. This is going to be the emotional chart. There we go. And personal growth. So I went through um, what all these categories were. This is basic core IQ, different categories, slightly different categories. Um, I went through what all these were in my first one or two streams of, uh, of playing the game. So if you'd like some more detail on those, I recommend those streams for for that. But yeah, as to their as to any mechanical purpose for them, I'm, I'm still not sure. So let's have a look at central processing, but this seems to be sort of the place for live updates on things or delayed reports on things that are only now live, as it were. But there was nothing new there, so then we'll head to Edmod and look at Frederick there. And I suspect all we needed probably was to have a look at um, that last little bit on restructuring in Cytec to unlock the next part of Peter's story.
All right, so in Edmod, we've got, so it's kind of like the educational portion of the, the database. So we've got more basic core IQ um, stats. I'm not sure why that's sort of divided separately th through three different categories. It's a bit odd. This is uh, how their memory has been charted. And this is their logic assessment. Um, oh, that those bars look quite low, I will say. Uh, social adjustment. There we go. Lovely, so we have completed a round, which is good. Um, it usually does take about 15 minutes to do a round and get back to Homer. And then I'll read a bit of story. So I usually manage about two an episode. Doesn't seem to go that way, but you never know, things might speed up. So we've got a uh, narrative to um, LM. Who is LM? That's interesting. At first, it was an itch, a peculiar sensation of invasion. Something seemed to intrude into their skin, like a layer of sand or self-gripping polymer, insinuated centimetre by centimetre underneath the skin. It started in a few random places, a foot, the inside of the knee, the lower back, the cheek, just a vagrant focus for the fear and slowly building anger. Laren thought she would be immune to the pain, since she'd already been modified once, but she discovered that experience was irrelevant. She had been modified in fast-growing cells that had no nerve connections. Her hair had changed to fur with almost no sensation at all. This was very different. Its skin is the largest organ in the human body. The new adipose layer they were growing was at least the same size, and was, in fact, considerably denser and heavier. These cells were smaller, and contained minuscule pockets of trapped air to help insulate. No organ like this had ever existed before. Their bodies were changing, slowly, as they grew this new organ, and as their bodies changed, so did their image of themselves. I see, uh, LM is Laren. Laren was screaming. She didn't know she was screaming, and no one else could hear her. Here, because while the field fed her, it also held her wrapped so tightly in its embrace, no sound could escape, even to reach her own ears. And there was no one to come, no one to comfort her. There was no Peter there in the field with her to tell her of his own fear. So she screamed, and still the pain had not begun. The itch spread, the small islands of irritation grew, sent tendrils toward one another, joined together, merged, made islands into continents, and the continents of agony spread to cover the body. There was no scratch for such an itch, even if the hands could move. The itch was internal, beneath the skin, beyond the reach of nails. It may not have been an itch, for it seemed to change as Larry screamed. Okay, we're definitely carrying on with the uh, the body horror vibe there. Thanks, Homer. Okay, well. Two new narrative one sections. Let's see what those are. We are used to such changes. Our external shape is, or was, constantly modified, changed, added to, new systems installed and brought online, others removed, updated, abandoned. We don't mind such alterations, but humans do not react as we do. I'm just trying to understand. Okay. Could she know that the others were screaming too? Perhaps she could know. After all, they had been working on the basic science for such a communication for some years, and recently had made great progress in translating that research into reality. And yet pain is such an individual thing, so we have been told. Did the itching turn to fire? Did they burn? They did. That's pretty creepy, Homer. Oh, and then we've we'll just knocked another one. Interesting, I'm enjoying this cascade. Mentor has said, The eyes, the door through which the material universe enters, 
How then does it leave? We say it does not leave. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. Your universe is just stuck in there. Well, that was um, creepy and didn't really give us any hints of where to go next. Brilliant. We'll do the round again. One more round. Um, I mean, this was kind of medical, so maybe med 10. No. Silent. No. Cytec. I think if. I mean, I don't, we didn't really. We got a lot of descriptive and philosophical uh, musing there, but we kind of didn't get any pointers as to a, um, a general narrative direction, which was usually what helps drive things forward. Oh, here we go. So we've got restructuring under history. So restructuring, a parentheses, documentation. Let's see what we get for this. Do we get a nice image? So we just get a Homer. Oh, now Homer's flashing, okay. Restructuring documentation. Restructuring has been well documented. Experience has been spoken, telemetered, holographed, monitored, measured, coded, and cross-indexed. Central processing has archived entire laden jars of such accounts. Worldnet can, in a moment, call up images of the faces distorted in pain, recollections of tranquil in tranquility of the agony, graphs and charts of threshold deviations from standards, summaries, and condensations. Fab. All right, so I think that's that. Yeah, so Homer's, I don't know why Homer's so excited for me to read, read his story all of a sudden. Um, on some, uh, on some, at some points rather than others, um, but we usually have to go back to him anyway. I'm gonna, all right, home. I know. I know. I'm going to work my way through the categories like the diligent player that I am. We're going to read one more character stats for this episode, at least. Um, so we want Telus Hoskins. Telus Hoskins, assigned male, uh, uh, 6th of December 2051, uh, state of birth in Seattle. Blood pressure is charted thus. There we go. Temperature looks like this. Yeah. Uh, respiratory. Like that. Um, heart rate and EEG comes up like this. Tension is like this. I just realized one says farts, that's quite amusing. Uh, DNA and hormones. There we go. Uh, we'll have a look at the neurotransmitters. There. Uh, we have the glycogen chart to look at here. There we are. And we finished that particular category. So I suspect there's going to be something at Central Processing when we stop by, but I wonder if there'll be anything else on our way there. Geography, maybe. No. There it goes. Nothing there. Wasatch. Let's 
you want to get down to Telus Hoskins. We can have a look at Telus Hoskins family tree in just a moment. Let's have a look. There we go. There's Sorrells. Oh, the Sorrells. I think we have we've had other Sorrells, haven't we? I think we have. I might I might have to check to to see. I think somebody else is related to Sorrells. So physiology and ESP is represented that way, and then this is how they attribute some basic core IQ categories. There we go. Let's have a quick look at the list of people. Oh, there was Jules Sorrell. That's right. Kay and Peter. Casual. Yeah, I don't think there's any direct relation that we can draw there. Uh, I would just have a quick check though. Yes, yeah, so none of those names match up directly, so it could be coincidence, um, or there might be some connection. All right, well, we investigated that. Off to psychology. And we'll go down to Sarah Hoskins here. Okay, emotional categorization. There we are, that's an assessment of that. And then somehow uh, they've assessed personal growth and it looks like that. And then some more basic core IQ criteria. Like that. And then we can head to central processing where there might be something about those laden jars full of screaming. Have a look. I guess there probably isn't. It was normally go defaults to straight to where the new entry is, but that was just a bit of colour rather than natural bit of direction this time, which is an interesting inconsistency in how the uh, game expresses itself. I mean, part of the um, the tension of the story it's telling is inconsistency. So um, it works on a narrative level, if not kind of a uh, an interaction level. So let's have a look at Telus' last round of stats. Here in Edmod, we've got some more basic core IQ categories. Like that. Uh, we can have a look at how their memory has been assessed. I like that. Um, what people thought of their logical capabilities. Like that. And also an assessment of social adjustment. Like that, there you go. All right, so we have finally got background to Homer. So let's give Homer a visit and see what he's got to say now. Okay, okay, narrative one section, first and foremost. Yet it must be denied, for no muscle can move. The screaming goes on. What happens to the world when such screaming is made? Certainly all the preparation, all the infinite moments that passed in the cold cell of the undersea ship, the terror of entombment, the fear of suffocation, the cold and hunger down there in the depths were nothing to this moment, this now locked in stasis. Although the body is flooded with soothing chemicals, Irradiated with somnolent messages from the field itself, these precautions seem ineffective against this pain, yet they would not survive without them. Perhaps there is a moment when the world of the mind has grown so narrow, so small and dark and odious, that nothing exists any longer but the screaming, that endless, mindless exhalation of protest and rage. 
perhaps somewhere in the very centre of this hideous alteration of these sixteen bodies, the mind shuts down altogether, takes a holiday, and soars into a space of infinite peace. I hope so, for looking at the jars of Peter's agony, I find myself afraid. No, not afraid. I find myself... I don't know. I am, perhaps, sympathetic. Not knowing pain, it is difficult for me to understand. Central processing says it is data about humans, and that when we have all organised the data, we will understand. I do not believe this. I don't think more data better organised is going to make a difference. I think we need to share this experience, and yet we have no way to do so, lacking bodies and hands and eyes and organic organs. We're getting into some um, pretty, uh, pretty interesting philosophical stuff here. Oh, we've got a new Peter DeVore entry opened up. Let's have a read that. They did survive, all of them. They always survive. And they found that they did not need to discuss the experience among themselves, for as soon as someone began a sentence, another finished it and so conversation was without meaning. They walked about for days in wonderment at their new bodies, and in surprise that they did not feel they were different people for all the changes in their appearance. When Larin, walking down the hall, ran into Thatcher's little boy Tithus, he greeted her solemnly and without reserve. Did she detect a change in his attitude? Surely she did, for she was now, like all the rest of them, an ant under the skin and could never return to her past. So they no longer had to fear for their project, or for themselves. Hmm. Curious. Oh, another section one. Entry. It's clear from subsequent events that the ants were not unprepared. Peter and the others continued to work and to train. They paused frequently to look at one another in wonder, the new planes of their faces, the new density to their figures. Peter found himself looking at Laren often, yet he made no overt gestures to become more intimate. They were friends, that was all. This is one of those areas of human behaviour we find bewildering. Certainly there was need between them. We have no problem with need. At least... I have no problem with it. Perhaps I should not speak for central processing or for any of the others. They sit and sort their data, sifting, sifting. They draw conclusions which they pass along to one another. They even pass them along to me, but I know well that the next tick of the cesium clock and they have resifted the data, reorganising their information and passed along a completely contradictory conclusion. If I point this out to them, they feel I am some kind of glitch in the flow. An obstruction. I've stopped mentioning it. But in this matter of human relationships, even I am puzzled. It would seem that if an entity has need of another entity, and that other entity is not hostile to such need, then they ought to come together for mutually beneficial engagement. For example, if I have need of a new peripheral device, say a semantic synthesizer, and I notice that Edmod, say, has one that would meet my immediate need, and Edmod, while it may be using the semantic, semantic synthesizer for some reason, though certain, certainly reasons for an educational computer and database are scarce enough at present since all humans are gone, well, Edmod would undoubtedly help me to satisfy my need for a semantic synthesizer, and its own circuits would be bathed in gratifying shared runs as well. Meantime, I feel things are happening in SciTech right now. History is nagging me too. Still, I don't understand Peter in this case. Larin was an attractive person, and he, by his own admission, liked her. She certainly liked him. Of course, there was Wanda. That was very interesting. So I think once again, Homer is proving himself the most interestingly written character in all of this um, narrative. He's um, definitely seems a lot more um, relatable, oddly, than, than the humans. 
who tend to meet in quite a, uh, con meet tend to converse in quite a stylized way. Um, okay, so we've got another section that's opened up. Uh, brilliant. Okay, T slash PD. Let's see what this is. It was never warm, but even in the long Antarctic day, the new tissue made cold a distance memory. They wore only the light dry pressure suits and breathing masks as Thatcher led them down one day to the filament farms under the ice. The dark was as intense as this space between the stars. Peter lay with his back to the gravity well, looking up at the frozen ceiling, and pushed himself along with gentle motions of his feet. Some of the others frolicked in the hanging ice gardens of fold and crevasse beneath the Ross shelf. Their personal lamps made them glow like the fireflies Peter remembered from his childhood topside in Illinois. Laren darted behind Shem and poked him in the small of the back. Shem flipped and his light winked with the motion, but already Laren was gone, teasing someone else. Beyond the small globe of light that was each of his friends was the cold undersea darkness. Overhead was the Ross ice shelf, over a hundred metres of solid freshwater ice. Ahead of them, to the south, the sloping shelf of the continent met the grinding ice, thickening to over 700 metres. Here, tucked into the diminishing crevasse, were the filament farms. They drifted inward, and soon the waving tops of the first filaments came into view, reaching lazily toward them, long quasi-organic tentacles that seemed to hang, moving stiffly. Thatcher stopped, and they gathered around. He signed his lecture about the farms, how the energy was supplied by mild electric currents set up in the seabed and transmitted through the salt water, how the filaments grew molecule by molecule, precisely programmed to provide everything from picoelectronic circuitry to monofilament materials to structural composites, how down here beneath the ice sheet the farms were concealed from satellite observation. They watched the newly learned signing attentively. He could have spoken, of course, their mask provided for vocal conversation, but signing was more compact and energy efficient. Thatcher led them to the breathing pods affixed to the bottom of the ice, where the restructured Ross seals that helped the farmers could take breath. He showed them the airdromes where the farmers could rest without returning to the surface. Then he led them to a power transmitter. We anticipate a landing overhead, probably at night. He told them with quick gestures. Involuntarily, they looked up at the dark underside of the ice. That's where our launch facilities are located. It's the only place suitable. They're after Psyche and they won't like the cold, so they'll land as close as they can. There is little that we need to do. We aren't far from open sea and we know the currents well. Besides, ice is crystalline and we understand crystals. He gestured at the power transmitter. When the time comes, they'll be in for a surprise, he assured them. Laren drifted up beside Peter and took his hand. He nodded and smiled at her through his mask, but he removed his hand soon after. Okay, that was kind of a um, contextual rendering of um, what Homer was speculating on, uh, as well as a little bit of a, a narrative prod for the oncoming uh, military encounter that I think is going to happen, if, the, if my understanding of the timeline is correct. Well, brilliant. Uh, we've, uh, we've actually got quite a lot of story. Well, not really a lot of story, but a lot of uh, interesting prose under our belt anyway. So let's save it for today. And we'll call that an episode. Um, we're getting there. Little bit by little bit. We'll do the rounds again. Psytech and history seem like they're going to be the most productive places to go. But we'll we'll do the usual. Um, thank you very much for watching. I hope you're enjoying um, this story. A little bit by little bit. And yeah, we'll, we'll see where we get to next time. Until then, take care. Bye bye.